You've probably heard the horror story about that person that one day discovers something that looks like a pimple on their face. It's itchy and annoying and over time it gets bigger. Then one day they decide enough is enough and in front of the bathroom mirror they go at it with their fingers with the intention of popping the beast. To their utter disgust, there's no pus or blood. Instead, what comes out is a stream of tiny insects. Something creepy crawly laid its eggs inside their face. It's a tale that's been passed down through generations. But just how true is it? Can bugs really lay eggs in someone's face? This legend usually involves a spider, and today we'll talk about critters in many forms, but we'll first look at egg-laying face spiders. While people might have claimed to be the host of an egg-laying spider, it's just not true. There aren't any cases in the medical literature that detail this happening. The human body is just not a good place for a spider to lay eggs, so even if you had an open wound, that wouldn't be the place Miss Spider chose to dump her children to be. Moreover, spiders put their eggs in a tiny sack they've made, and the babies can get out of that. Trying to bury eggs under human skin would be pretty much spider infanticide, meaning she'd be killing her little eight-legged bundles of joy. If they hatched, they'd die. The female spider will also stick around with those eggs so she can check them, so that would mean the girl would have to hang out on a human body. She'd be with you at school, in the office, and doing her rounds while you're sleeping. It just doesn't happen. Spiders don't really even like being near humans, and they try to avoid us like the plague for the most part. So choosing a human as an egg-laying ground makes no sense at all. These guys are not parasitic, meaning they don't need to live off another animal. We hope that cleared things up for you. You can now live your life with the knowledge that at no point will you pick open a boil-like thing on your body and tiny spiders will burst out of it, running ecstatically over you as they experience their first taste of freedom. We should add that it is plausible that a spider could find an open orifice in a human and lay something there because, hey, a dark hole is a dark hole, but it's just not ideal for a spider to do that. Why would she abandon her eggs there? It's just not a safe place given the human proclivity to pick itchy orifices. She'd much rather lay her eggs in some dark corner or a dark cellar where things tend to be quiet. We did find one case in which a Chinese woman had an itchy ear for a few days, and if you believe the British tabloid press, the sound of the itchiness was a spider that made the woman's ear its home for five days. Why? But maybe it was lost, or maybe it wanted some adventure, or maybe it was lazy, we don't know. Anyway, no eggs were laid during its holiday in the hearing organ. This is all good news, so far, but things are going to get worse. We've allayed your fears about baby spider eruptions, and now we'll provide you with some more frightening information. There's a video on YouTube with the terrifying title of Removing Botfly Larva from Under Human Skin. Over 1.6 million people have witnessed the small operation and no doubt will agree the entire thing is quite gross. So what's a botfly and how are they getting under our skin? You might have heard them called warble flies or heel flies or gadflies, but what's important to know is that some kinds of female botfly will have this trick of basically getting a free ride on the back of a mosquito. She then attaches her eggs to the mozzie, and when you have your blood sucked on those eggs, they get in the hole. You've become the host for the squatters. Humans are not usually the victim, but it happens. Animals aren't as good as protecting themselves as humans, but some humans just get unlucky. There's a thing called meiosis, which means a parasitic insect has used an animal as a host and an infection of maggots has happened. Sometimes the meiotic flies might use an open wound to do their egg laying, but sometimes they can break through unbroken skin. The eggs might end up on food and then make their way into a person's stomach. They also have been known to enter the body through the eyes, the ears, and the nose. Let's now have a look at some real life cases. The National Institutes of Health writes that human infestation is rare, but it does happen. It sounds a bit like the spiders in the face story we talked about at the start of the show, in that a person will complain of a painful bump or a sore on the skin that might just get misdiagnosed as a boil or a cyst or an insect bite, but it's actually larvae doing its business in the warm human host. NIH gives the example of a 25-year-old man who went to see the doctor complaining of a painful lump on his head. The doctor said it was a cyst and then it was drained, but the lump came back. They drained it again, and a few weeks later he returned to see the doctor again. There was a lump again, so they decided to have a look deeper inside. This is what NIH said happened next. Upon subcutaneous dissection, a black 1.4 cm long foreign body was encountered. It appeared to be a cocoon or insect larva. It seems the guy had become host after his three week long honeymoon in Costa Rica. In that case, it was thought a botfly had likely done his hijacking routine on a mosquito and that's how the man became a victim. NIH added some more information about how the larvae survive in the human. They said, while in the skin, the larvae breathe through small openings in the skin, which they also use to dispose of their serosanguinous feces. They develop concentric rows of small black spicules that assist in anchoring them in place, and can grow up to 3 centimeters in length. 
at least they got rid of their feces, so we can applaud them for having good manners while they stay at the human hotel. Serosanguinous, by the way, relates to liquid drainage. The good news is this doesn't happen often in the United States, and the bad news is when it does, it can be very painful and also pretty gross. Even worse news is that the NIH said fatalities have been reported when the larvae got into soft parts of newborn skulls, something called the fontanelles. That won't affect you because you've grown up. If you think you have something living in your skin, you should of course see a doctor, but NIH said there are simple methods to make the larvae move out of the house they're living in. You can basically suffocate them by putting tape on the wound, or covering it with petroleum jelly, or even pork fat. They have no breathing hole and so come out and migrate. We found another story about an American taxonomist, you know, someone who groups different organisms, and he returned home with a very painful swelling on his head. As this guy was a scientist, he had a suspicion regarding what was going on and what was causing the pain. He told Wired that the reason for the intense pain was because those things rotate under the skin. He told Wired, so at that point, the typical reaction is that you know you have a maggot in your body and you must get it out. That same article mentioned a young girl who started hearing crunching sounds when she was not eating. That sound was larvae feeding on her from inside her ear. When humans get infested, there's a wound and the larvae feed on that wound. But enough of botflies, what else can get into us? The scabies might could get into humans. If they do, they'll likely be too small to see, but you'll get an itch and some redness. They might be passed from human to human and dogs might give them to you too. When they get into human flesh through a small burrow, the female might lay some eggs, which will take from three to five days to hatch into larvae. The larvae then might move around on the skin, but they are tiny. When these things start burrowing, it can cause an allergic reaction, and that's why there's some itching going on. It's just an immune system response to something foreign invading you. If you keep scratching that itch, you might get a secondary infection, so you should try not to do that. Getting rid of scabies is a story in itself, so we suggest you look that up if you want to know. Then there's the screw worm fly, which sounds a bit scarier than the scabies might. These things look for open wounds where they can lay their eggs, and while animals are usually their host, it's said humans are fair game. Apparently, there was a recent screw worm outbreak in Florida, but the media said it was only cattle and pets that got hit. Once mother screw worm finds an open wound, she'll lay her eggs there. The maggots that hatch can then start eating the flesh. The good news is that one scientist said humans are pretty much their last choice. NIH wrote about some cases that happened in South America, saying one reason the people became the hosts was because they didn't take care of their wounds. They were very poor or sick or mentally ill. What about the dreaded head lice, things that pick on millions of American kids every year? Well, as annoying as they might be, they aren't anywhere near as gross or dangerous as the things we've talked about. They might cause some itching and embarrassment to a kid whose peers are not very nice. But anyone can get these things, and an infestation has nothing to do with personal hygiene. Head lice endorse equal opportunities when it comes to finding a host. They don't jump on people, but are spread from head to head, or from objects that have been on a head such as a hat or a comb. The spreading through objects isn't very common. They apparently love thick and clean hair. The females do lay eggs in the hair, which are commonly referred to as nits. They lay them close to the scalp, so we can't say anything goes on inside the host. Much worse is the tumbu fly, and this should really only be an annoyance to people who live in the tropical regions of Africa. These things might lay their eggs on damp clothes and find their way into humans from there. We found a story of a British woman who had been working in Africa, and when she got home, she started to get a painful itch. She told the British media, When I found a yellow one on my stomach, I just thought it was a small infected bite with pus, and I thought squeezing it might help. But when she squeezed, she felt something pull back. There was something living inside of her. She told her husband to get some tweezers, and together they did a bit of ad hoc surgery. The outcome was what she described as a large maggot being pulled out of her. She took a trip to the hospital and was told that the maggots were trying to eat their way out of her. But all was well because within no time at all, the doctors got eight of them out. The woman and her husband had already already got six of them, so that meant she'd been host to 14 maggots in total. One doctor that was interviewed said the extraction process can be hard and sometimes goes wrong when the maggot splits, so he said a good thing to do is suffocate the things just like the NIH said. We'll finish this with something called Ekbom syndrome, which is also called delusional parasitosis. This is when a person is convinced they're infested with bugs or parasites, but it's actually all in their head. We've actually felt our skin crawl making the show, so we can understand it happens. People might scratch themselves like crazy or keep taking hot showers. And even if they can get a medical diagnosis telling them they're delusional, they'll often not believe it. You could say this is the worst thing we've talked about today because
because there is no easy cure. You might argue that pulling a few maggots out of your head is not anywhere near as bad as having an infestation that no one can find and no one but you believes in. Have you or anyone you know ever been host to anything like this? Tell us the story in the comments. Now go watch crazy things a doctor removed from inside a person's body. Thanks for watching and as always don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you next time.